Okay, good evening. Welcome everybody to the fourth and last of this year's um, Department of Philosophy slash Library Talks. We've been doing these for 15 years now. The first one of these is in 2000. And you know, people still come out, so you know, it, it, I think this has been a successful um, endeavor all in all. Since this is the last of this, the, of this year's talk, I want to talk, thank some of the people behind the scenes to make it possible. First of all, Margaret, oh, you know, our, our liaison with the library. <laughs> we would not be here. Greg, our videographer. Um, I don't know if she's here, but Deborah Fox from the Rotman Institute has been uh, um, responsible for a lot of the publicity for this. This year, um, so the this is something that the philosophy department and the library has been doing since 2000. But this year is a special thing because it's co-sponsored by the Rotman Institute, um, Einstein at as part of the Einstein at Rotman celebration, celebrating um, 100 years since Einstein's um, theory of relativity. So I'd like to thank the Rotman Institute and the director of the institute, Chris Meek, is back there. If you have it, if you want even more Einstein, he's going to be giving a talk here as part of the classics, Classes Without Quizzes uh, series. It's going to be here in two weeks' time on November 10th. And I'd also like to thank two people who aren't here. Stathis Psilos, who was here for two, uh, two weeks ago giving a talk. He was the one who first floated the idea of having an Einstein at Rotman um, series. And also Carl Hafer, the um, former director of the Rotman Institute who was in on the, on the planning of, of this thing from the beginning. So thank you, Stathis and Carl. I'm not talking, so general relativity was 1915. I'm actually talking about something that, uh, today that Einstein did 10 years earlier. So I've got a picture of the young Einstein there. He's famous for a lot of things any way, one of which would have made him a famous physicist. And I'm going to talk about something that you know, people who are Einstein experts know about, but other people don't, um, per, uh, 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 other people I, I, I think will be less familiar to, to you. Einstein was instrumental in the process that got the idea that everything was made up of atoms accepted. And you might say, hey, wait, hold on, Einstein is 20th century. Wasn't that an old idea? Yes, it was. It was an old idea, but up until the late 19th century and early 20th century, it was still a controversial idea. So, for example, here, 1869 is the president of the Chemical Society of London. Says, I think I'm not overstating the case when I say that, on the one hand, all chemists use the atomic theory, on the other hand, a considerable number of them view it with mistrust, some with positive dislike. That's 1869. And he's right, you can't trust atoms. <laughs> um, by 1912, pretty much everybody was a convert. Henri Poincaré was um, one of the last holdouts. He was, through most of his career, very skeptical of the idea that gases are made up of molecules bouncing around and skeptic skeptical of the idea that these things that chemists were talking about, these atoms were actually part of the real world and they actually did make things up, make up things. But by 1912, he, even he was convinced and he said, the atom of the chemist is now a reality. I want to talk about what happened in between 1869 and 1912 and I stand as part of it. But to start, I want to talk about some of the prehistory of this. The old, where's the word Adam come from in the first place? Someone should know. Democritus. Democritus, yes. 19th century? <laughs> 18, a little bit before? Fourth century, yeah, fourth century um, BC. And he, so, he, um, the, um, so I don't have a, pho a, a photograph of Democritus. Um, it's an artist's rendering. Um, yeah, so he's famous saying that every but everything in the world is just atoms in the void. So, okay, he. 
Do we credit Democritus? Well, why, why in the fourth century BC wasn't everybody convinced? Because people were saying this already. Well, kind of think about where, where things are. He can say that. But you know, you can say anything. And people were saying lots of things at the time. So some of his, oh, by the, yeah. The word Adam, I forgot to mention that. It comes from the Greek and it means can't be cut. Indivisible. Okay, so back in the, in, in the 4th and 5th century B B BC, there were lots of people who had lots of ideas about what the world was made of. There was Thales who said everything was water. There was Her Her Heraclitus who said everything was fire. And Aximander who said the, everything is this indefinite, I don't even know what's supposed to mean. The, the infinite, indefinite, <laughs> unbounded. Um, and Eximenes say it's all air. And you know what? Talk is cheap. You can say that. And if you were back there in the 4th or 5th century uh, um, BC, what do you do? You pick the one you like the best or what? Speculation is easy. And I say that because there's a tendency for, if you're looking at the history of an idea, to really be concerned about going back and say, who's the first person who said this? Who's first person? And I want to claim is, in most cases, that's a really in, uninteresting question. Who's the per first person who enunciated the inverse square law of, gra of gravity? Not Newton. You know, not clear who it, who it was, but it definitely wasn't Newton. Newton, on the other hand, is the one who really made a case that that's how gravity um, behaves. And so, yeah, Democritus said all is Adam in the void. And, but okay, yeah, you can do that, but how did it get to the point where by the 20th, first few decades of the 20th century, even the most skeptics were convinced that that actually is true? So that's what I want to talk about today. How did the atoms um, get turned from speculation to fact? Evidence. Now, if you think about that, that's a little puzzling because scientific evidence is supposed to be based on observation, things that we can hear, see, smell, touch. And we can't see atoms. We can't hear, we, uh, um, hear individual atoms. Yeah. So how can we have evidence that these things that we can't see and can't directly observe exist? And the answer is, if we don't have, even though we don't have direct evidence, what we see can become indirect evidence for it. Um, and you know, that's actually a familiar idea. When Sherlock Holmes goes to the scene of a crime, he doesn't see what happened there, he sees indirect evidence and draws conclusions from that. And that's often what scientists do. They look at what they can see, what they can observe, and Sometimes a, a complicated chain of reasoning, use that to tell, the, tell us about something you don't directly observe. Okay. So first clue and um, confession. I spent some time looking for the first person who said this and then I realized, hold it, wait, I shouldn't care. So I have no idea who the first person uh, who, uh, to enunciate this. It's associated with the name of Louis-Joseph Proust, a French chemist. Um, working, but sometime in the late 18th and early 19th century, chemists became convinced, or at least most of them did, that when chemical elements combine, they don't just combine in any kind of ratios, they are fixed proportions by weight. Now, what um, a number of chemists then did is take that off and say, well, I can explain that if there are small indivisible pieces of these elements that only combine in, in integer numbers. And again, I have no idea who the first person who said that, but a man who made an awful lot of hay out of it and um, helped promote the idea was a man named John Dalton. This is um, from his book, A New System of Chemical Philosophy. Okay, I'm talking about philosophy here. Um, so this is a picture from his book. He's got the elements. He's got the various ways that can, they could combine. 
you can't read it, but the first one is combinations of hydrogen and oxygen. He had this rule of simplicity I I that that um, the simplest way anything can com any two elements can combine will always be just one atom of each. And we all know simplicity is a guide to truth in science, so water is HO. Okay, he didn't get everything right. But, um, and, you know, here again, this is a symptom of they're working with very indirect evidence. They've got ratios but, and fixed ratios, um, but they really don't know when water combines how many atoms of, of hydrogen are combining to, with how many atoms of oxygen. Okay, here's another clue. Um, Amadeo Avogadro. And yes, I guess that's what he looks like because that's a, a, a portrait that I found. Um, so, he, start, he, he wrote a famous essay in 1811. He starts with something called the Gay-Lussac Law, um, which might have been first enunciated by the Gay-Lussac, but probably not, um, because it's called the Gay-Lussac Law. Um, and the idea is the Gay-Lussac Law is that gases, so we, before we were t talking about chemical combinations by weight, he observes that when gases combine chemically, they combine in um, fixed ratio by volume. For example, if I take two liters of hydrogen and one, and, um, one liter of oxygen, sorry, there's a typo, um, one liter of oxygen, they combine to, find, to, to, to form water. And um, Amadeo, Adat de Amadeo said, okay, the obvious hypothesis, the first hypothesis to present itself in this connection and apparently only, even the only admissible one is the supposition that the number of integral molecules in any gases is always the same for, the, for equal volumes or always proportional to the volumes, implicit at the same temperature and pressure. Because if you um, expand the gas, um, then you know, the number of, of molecules isn't going to change. So take two volumes of gas, one liter of one gas, another liter of another gas, um, same temperature and pressure, they're going to, uh, uh, Avogadro's hypothesis was um, that um, they, can't, they, 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 um, can, they contain the same number of molecules. We now call that Avogadro's law. But in 1811, it was a hypothesis. Okay, and in fact, now we call, talk about Avogadro's number. Um, that's the number of um, molecules that are in a certain standard uh, uh, amount of a gas. Um, um, in the original def de definition, it was two grams of hydrogen gas at standard temperature pressure. That's basically um, room temperature and um, one atmosphere pressure. Um, we now use something that's almost but not exactly equivalent to it is um, a number of atoms in 12 grams of carbon-12. Some of you might know carbon has two isotopes, carbon-12 and carbon-14. It's a basis of carbon dating. So, here's a question. Avogadro had this hypothesis, but he had no idea what that number was. He figured it was a big one, but how big? Um, one of uh, um, the um, foremost researchers on gases in the late 19th century, Ludwig Boltzmann, in one of his lectures on gas theory, he says, you know, I don't know, we don't know how big it is, but it's probably huge, thousands. So what would I do if I want to know how many molecules there are on the moon? One, well, I can't see them. How do I count them? And that's where Einstein comes in. And I'm going to get this, show you a little video. Oops, it's, there it is. And we get some nice pretty music too. Okay. A 
okay, those were not a little amoeba dance, dancing around. Those were not um, um, bacteria. Those are pollen grains. And they're dancing around not because they're sitting on a piano um, uh, um, with this playing pretty music. Um, that's what happens in still water. You, uh, um, and by this point, you know, by, by, by the late 19th century, this was a fairly well-established phenomenon that you can take pollen, you know, water, you can sit it down, you can let it come to, come to rest, wait for any vibrations to, get to, to go away, look at it on the microscope, and little particles such as pollen grains that are suspended in it continue to dance around. And they're not living things. You can sterilize this thing and it happens. You can, you, you can leave the thing closed for years, so if anything was living in there, they'd starve to death. It still happens. And that was puzzling. So here's where Einstein comes in. Here's one of the um, papers that he published in his so-called Annus Mirabilis in 1905, um, Uber de, de von die Molecular Welt. In English, on the motion of small particles suspended in liquids at rest required by the molecular kinetic theory of heat. Still a theory. So when he talked about the molecular theory, kinetic theory of heat, that's the theory that Heat isn't a substance. Heat is the motion of molecules. Um, I, the gases are composed of, of molecules bouncing around, and the hotter it is, the faster. A theory in 1905. And he, he asked himself, well, if that's right, if a fluid such as a gas or a liquid is contain, consists of a lot of molecules bouncing around, what would happen to small particles suspended in it? Well, if you're a small particle spin liquid, you're being constantly bombarded by these molecules, and you tend to wiggle, wiggle around. Um, so you know, this is Einstein thinking of, of the path of, one of, the, uh, of a suspended particle. It's going to bounce around irregularly. Well, how much is it going to bounce around? Well, if there's lots and lots of molecules always hitting it from all sides, they're going to kind of average out, and there's not going to be a lot of motion. And it's not going to go, go very far in a certain time. And if there are fewer molecules, you're, you're going to get a more um, thing. And so what he did is he worked out a formula. And one difference between what Einstein was doing and other people who had thought about this subject um, other than a, another physicist um, named Smolikowski, is he didn't actually ask himself how the velocity is going to change because he, like, because he realized that the velocity of such a particle would be just so irregular, you wouldn't be able to measure it. That would be really hard. But what we would be able to do is measure where it is at a given time, wait a bit, and see where it is at another later time. And so he asked himself, on average, how far, how far is a, par a particle like that going, going, going to move in a given time? And the answer is, that depends on the number of molecules. If there's lots of them, it's not going to move a lot. If there's only a few of them, it's going to move a lot. And you can use measurements of the, uh, of, of the um, the, the phrase is mean square displacement. You can, wait, you can, um, use a measurement of, of how far one of those things tends to go in the amount of time to estimate the number of molecules per unit volume in the liquid that surrounds it. So he writes down a formula, <laughs> other stuff. So, uh, uh, so if, we, if we can see these par you know, particles through the microscope, we could use them to estimate Avogadro's number. Now, I didn't have it up very long, but I'm sure some of you noticed something interesting about those first couple paragraphs. For those who, who, who didn't, I just want to hi highlight the, the last sentence of that, of that first paragraph. He says, it's possible that the motions to be discussed here are identical with the so-called Brownian motion. 
However, the data available to me are so imprecise that I could not form a judgment on the question. Now, one of the reasons that the um, data were imprecise, or, or the data available to him were imprecise, is that it wasn't his job to do this. He was working at the time in the Swiss Patent Office, and he actually couldn't get to university libraries while they were open. He, used, he, um, he, he, he later, um, in an interview, said, well, you know, I would do my work in two or three hours, and then I would use the rest of the time to write scientific papers. And when my boss came, I would shove them in the drawer. OK, so that's him actually at the Swiss Patent Office um, um, with his papers hidden in a drawer or something like that. Yes, yeah, so, but another re so one reason that the data available to him were imprecise is he couldn't get to the, to the academic libraries. But another re reason was it was actually very, very difficult to make precise um, measurements of, of, of this kind of thing. And so this is interesting. He's not starting from the observed phenomenon of Brownian motion. He's saying, okay, well, what would happen if indeed gases and liquids are made up of molecules bouncing around. And it's a, he, he realized it was a prediction of the theory that small particles would jiggle about. OK, so now we need someone to actually do the observations. Enter um, a, French, a Frenchman named Jean Perrin, looking very stylish. <laughs> So he, so he did this. He, he performed, I'm not going to go into details. It was a, a not an easy experiment to do, but he um, suspended particles in liquid and, per, and um, performed detailed observations of them. In particular, he measured that <coughs> quantity that Einstein you, uh, um, to, said in his formula would be, tell you how big Avogadro's number was. He measured the mean square displacement. And he did es es estimate Avogadro's number. Boltzmann was a little bit off when he said thousands. <laughs> In fact, he was way off. Um, so this is um, six something followed by 23 zeros. Some of you might know the, the, the modern e estimate of, the, of it, anybody? 6.023, something like that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. yeah. Right, so it's not exactly right, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's pretty darn close. So this was, up to that time, the best um, estimate of Avogadro's number. OK, I know what you're saying. So what? <laughs> <laughs> well, here's so what. There are other ways to estimate Avogadro's number. In comes Marie Curie. Um, Curie and other um, f f physicists are studying radioactive decay at the time. And in at, at the, at radioactive decay, uh, um, well, a, a, the substance would emit certain particles with high energy that could show up on, as bursts of light on the screen. You could actually count the number of particles being emitted. And then, if you gather them up, uh, we, we, we now call alpha particles helium nuclei. You gather them up, they grab, gather electrons from somewhere, and you get some helium gas. So you can actually count the number of helium nuclei that are being um, emitted, and then you can measure the volume of gas, and you can estimate Avogadro's number that way. Ever wondered why the sky is blue? Nobody knew until the late 19th or 20th century, early 20th century, why the sky was blue. It's a phenomenon called Rayleigh scattering. What happens is white light, as you may know, is composed of light of all frequencies. The um, higher frequencies are in blue and purple end of the uh, uh, um, spectrum. They have more energy. The lower frequencies are red. Um, in the upper atmosphere, the blue light scatters more off of molecules than, than, the, the, than the red light. So if you think about it, you know, like when you look at the sky, the sky is, is bright in the daytime everywhere. All that light's coming from the sun. So if the sun's up there and you're looking over there and you're seeing light, that's light that got scattered all the way over there before it got to your eye. 
And Rayleigh, or John William Strutt, Lord Rayleigh, he figured out that he, he did a calculation of the expected scattering and how much scattering you expect to get for a given wavelength depends on the number of molecules in a certain volume of gas. And so you can, uh, you, you can estimate Avogadro's number that way too. And what Claren did, he wrote a book called Les Atomes, Atoms. What Claren did is he drew up a table of all the ways he knew about of estimating Avogadro's number. So um, this from the viscosity of gases, I didn't talk about that. These are times 10 to the um, 22nd. So there's 62 there. The, there's the, the ones that he did on Brownian motion. There's a number of different kinds of measurements you can do. I, um, I mentioned only one about displacement. That's where the, the number 68.8 times 10 to the 22nd coming. There's others. Blue of the sky, 60, question mark, because that one's not that precise. Um, radioactivity from various things. There's, there's um, helium engendered, which is the one I was talking about, 64. Okay, they're not all the same number. But remember, before people any did this, they had no clue what Avogadro's might, could, might be. It could be thousands, it could be millions, it could be billions. All of these are at least in the same ballpark. Now, if there are no atoms, if molecules don't really exist, there is no reason whatsoever for those um, measurements to be anywhere even close. Obviously, you do an experiment, you get results of the experiment, you're going to get your, you, you do a calculation, you can get some number, but only if there actually are atoms and molecules are all these <coughs> things measuring the same thing. And only if there are atoms and molecules is there any reason for any of them to be even somewhere close. And here's what Paran says about that. He says, our wonder is aroused at the very remarkable agreement found between values derived from the consideration of some widely different phenomena. Seeing that not only is the same magnitude of, of, obtained by each method when the conditions under which it's applied are varied as much as possible, but the numbers thus established also agree among themselves without discrepancy. Look, he's exaggerating there a bit. But without much discrepancy, for all the methods of poise, the real existence of a molecule is given a probability bordering on certainty. You say, hold it, wait, isn't, what do you mean probability? This is science, I want proof. Well, actually, this is what you get. Um, and this is something um, that I wish when um, reporters um, reported scientific results that they would emphasize more. Um, because you, uh, in, in the news you get, scientists found that blah, blah, blah. And they, and they never say, well, how certain are, are they or that, some of that. What you get from science, you don't get absolute certainty. What you get is very good evidence for certain things. Um, and um, it, you know, it can, when it's good enough, it can be as close a certainty as, um, as, as you need. Um, think of the standards of evidence in the court of law. To get a conviction, you, you know, the prosecution does not have to prove beyond any possible doubt that the person is guilty. The standard is uh, um, a person, the, the prosecution has to establish beyond reasonable doubt. So what Paran is saying and what, um, what Poincaré was saying in that um, in, in that um, slide I had at the beginning is, yeah, now finally, after 25 centuries of speculation of at about atoms, it's pro finally proved beyond e reasonable doubt. Now you might have noticed something. Good, good old Democritus coined the word atom. What did the word atom mean, who remembers from 30 minutes ago? Can that be divided? Can atoms be divided? 
Part of the evidence that they existed came from radioactive decay, which is atoms coming apart. So at the very time that finally this issue of the existence of, of atoms is being settled, we're also learning that they're actually not very much like what Democritus thought they were. And um, Peran closes his book with, um, a, with some nice words, he says, in achieving this victory, we see that all the definiteness and finality of the original theory, it means that the ancient atom theory, has vanished. Atoms are no longer eternal, indivisible entities, setting a limit to the possible by their irreducible simplicity. Inconceivably minute though they may be, we're beginning to see in them a vast host of new worlds. So Peran in 1912 was looking forward and saying, you know what, we're going to learn a lot in the 20th century about, from studying the structure of atoms. And he turned out to be right. And that actually is also um, a very common feature of, um, of science. So when you, learn, when you learn something new and settle an old question, it opens up new ones. So there's always going to be something for scientists to continue to do. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, comments? No, no, we're, we're, we're going to let people who are not um, uh, um, faculty <laughs> No, yeah, I was talking to Ron here. Oh. Yes, you in the back. Yes, sir. Yes, you, sir, in the back. No, I was talking to Ron. Okay, um, yeah, I was just wondering, could you tell again what the, uh, the sorry, the, um, I forget those numbers, because it said that, uh, sorry, it's the number, can you just define it again? Yeah. Take 12 grams of, uh, 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 the, the way Peran originally defined it, take 2 grams of hydrogen, okay. hydrogen gas, it's the number of molecules in 2 grams of hydrogen gas. At standard temperature. Oh, yeah, at so standard, that, but, but, no, actually, no, the, 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 no, no two, it's the number it of molecules in 2 grams of, 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 uh, of, of, of yeah, yeah. Why does it apply, sorry, sorry, just, yeah. why does it apply to every, is it, does it not apply to everything, like, why does it, it's always you're using that in general with all the different molecules. So, like, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Do, is that true, or is it just a standard set by the... So, here, okay, yeah. So, good question, thank you. Thank you. Uh, because once you know the number, because, gee, like, none of these experiments were actually done with hydrogen gas. So, like, what, you know, what if I... Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, once I know how many... Mo uh, um, molecules there are in one, in two grams of hydrogen, of hydrogen. I can take one liter of hydrogen and weigh it, and so I know how many molecules there are in that. And I know that um, when oxygen and hydrogen combine to form water, they do it in a ratio of two to one to, 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 um, uh, to volume. Is this saying that like all, you can treat all elements, or sorry, all atoms of different sizes as essentially the same unit volume? Okay, let, let, yeah, let me, let, let me think, there's actually, actually an interesting pro, pro, uh, um, okay, yeah, process yeah. answer, so let me just finish what I was saying. Yeah, so I know that, um, Two liters of hydrogen gas combined with one liter of, ox of, of, of oxygen to form water. And the reason for that, according to, Av to Avogadro, is two, um, two molecules of hydrogen gas combined with one molecule of, 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 of oxygen to form water. So if I, know, if, I, if I know, if I've got a sample of hydrogen gas, and I know how many molecules in that, then I can figure out how many molecules there are in, that, in my sample of oxygen. Because I, because I know how many, because I know the amount of oxygen that it takes to combine with, with, with hydrogen is a two, it, it, it's two, ratio of two to one hydrogen to oxygen. So if I know, them, if I know the so number, so if I know the number of hydrogen atoms 
or so hydrogen molecules in the sample of gas, and I know that that combines in the two to one ratio with oxygen, that tells me the number of oxygen molecules. So and, now, and, and now if I know how much oxygen will combine with a certain amount of carbon, and I know to form carbon dioxide, and I know each one of those is one carbon and two oxygen, then I'll know how much many atoms there are in a certain sample of so carbon. Is Avogadro's number basically the link between the ratio part of chemistry and the actual um, metric part, sort of? You got it. Okay, okay, thank you. you. Got That's it. what I wanted to know. Okay, you got it, yeah. Right, right. Before, before they, they just had ratios, right. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. If I may offer, basically the common thread is the number of protons. Yeah. Am I right? Yeah. Um, yeah, so number of, um, um, it, 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 it's, it's the number of nuclei that count, um, whether it's, pr and then um, the, the weight of it. So they also no noticed the things where um, the chemical elements had fixed grids. So it's the number of you know, nuclei made of protons and neutrons have, to a first approximation, the same weight. So it's the number of nuclei, protons and neutrons yeah, in the, in, 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 in the nucleus. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, so um, um, oxygen has an atomic weight of 16. It means that the same number of, um, of um, oxygen molecules weighs 16, you know, six times teams as much as the same number of um, hydrogen molecules. Yeah, yeah so th those ratios, are the weight ratios were known to pretty, good, by the end of the 19th century, those weight ratios were known, uh, known, known to a pretty good d degree. Yes, sir? Um, what are the uh, properties of Einstein's formula that uh, makes it give Avogadro's number Okay, so what it so so how so how does Einstein get a a a a, a, a formula um, from that, that goes from the 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 linked number of molecules to this displacement? Yeah. So it, it's um, is that the question? So um, there's actually um, quite a bit that goes into the reasoning. One thing is the idea that. Um, if two things are at the same temperature, um, each one of the, um, you know, you've got, uh, um, um, so if you have two substances at the same temperature, each of the molecules will have on average the same kinetic energy. And so if you know the temperature, you know on average how hard those hits are gonna be and if you know how, on average, how hard those kit hits are going to be, and you know how often they're going to happen because you know, on average, how fast these things are going, then you know, on average, how, how, how far something's going, the effect of each one of those hits. And um, what you don't do is observe the individual hits by molecules. You observe the net effect of lots and lots of hits over a certain amount of time and if you know how hard they're hitting, um, and if you know the frequency of hits um, per, you know, how, how often a given molecule would expect to hit, you would expect to hit the falling grain, then you'll get an idea of how many there are. So it's like, um, does Einstein's formulas uh, incorporate that much the same way as other methods to um, derive um, in each case, what you have to do is um, somehow or another link something that you can actually measure with the number of molecules. In each case, actually, the reasoning is very different. Yes. Yeah. Um, what, what, yeah. Um, why, given the, uh, the state of them being different sizes, why does the um, you're saying basically that it comes down to weight, which comes down to the kinetic um, motions of the of the ball, right? In question, why does the why does the kinetic motion become equal of all the different balls? Like 
even though they're this, is it because they're all the same size that the, the mass gets thrown out? Kind of. Do you know what I'm saying at all? Or not? Um. Yeah. So yeah. So um, I do. I think I do think I know what you're saying. So like, if I have a gas that's composed of the same thing. Yeah, or, imagine I've got a gas that's composed of different things. So for example. Yeah. Imagine I was standing in a room that contains a mixture of nitrogen and oxygen and other gases. <laughs> this shouldn't be too hard to imagine. <laughs> um, the, um, the, um, the oxygen molecules and the nitrogen mo molecules have different weights. Um, and as they bounce around and collide, so um, actually, let me go. So imagine I've got hydrogen and oxygen together, because there's more contrast the weight there. So I've got hydrogen and oxygen together. Nobody lay a spark. Um, and the oxygen molecules weigh 16 times as much as the hydrogen molecules. So what happens when they collide? Well, um, what's going to happen is that if they collide, the, um, the hydrogen molecule, because it's lighter, is going to pick up more speed than, than, than the oxygen molecule does. And if, if a lot of that happens, on average, after a lot of collisions, the hydrogen molecules are going to be moving faster, the oxygen molecules are going to be moving slower, but kinetic energy is mass times velocity squared. And um, this is something that James Clark Maxwell and um, Ludwig Boltzmann argued for in the 19th century that the net effect of all these collisions is not to make the velocities equal, but to make the lighter ones have more velocity in such a way that the kinetic energy, mass times velocity squared, is going to be on average the same for both the, the heavy yeah, and the Because like, so you're looking at it from the energy perspective, which happens to be, you're right, if the, if the M and the these that would be different, but then they would be come the same because the energy is preserved, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. It's called the equipartition theorem. Perfect. Yes? Um, why is the sky violet? Why, is why isn't the sky violet? Very good question. <laughs> um, because the high. The, 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 you're right, the violet rays would get scattered even more. They get scattered so much that they don't even make it down to us. And at sunset, if you ever see a sunset, low on the horizon, the sky is red and then orange and yellow and then maybe blue up to right? If you think about it, the light that's low, when the sun's low on the horizon, the light that's coming directly from the sun has to go through more air than, than, the, than the light that's up. And, the, the, and, um, and that, that it goes, goes through more air than when it does when the sky, when, when the sun is right ahead. So when the, when the sky is directly ahead, a lot of light gets through and we, and we get a lot of blue. When the sky, sun's low in the sky, it's got so much air to go to, most of that blue gets scattered and doesn't even make it to us. And, and it. Yeah? Did um, Einstein, if you mentioned his work um, in 1905, yeah. did that, is thinking about that lead on to further things, like the general relativity, for example? Um, so the answer is yes. This, this work on Brownian motion led to uh, to um, further things. Um, he was really thinking about, um, at the time, about what we now call statistical mechanics and how, if you've got a system with lots and lots of things interacting with each other, how things would act on average. And in 1905, he, he used, I'm not going to talk about this thing, he used um, arguments based on those kinds of considerations to argue that light as long as as, as long as it's it, it, it is um, not too much energy density there acts as if it's um, uh, acts as if it's composed of small little packets of energy which eventually call, got called photons it's 
not exactly the same kind of reasoning, but it, but but a similar kind of reasoning in the in that it's imagining what happens when you've got a lot of, something with lots and lots of molecules interacting with li with, with with light. Um, and he did he did develop these ideas on Brownian motion further. But he had he 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 had a lot of um, different ideas. So in 1905, he also had his paper on special relativity. So he, you know, he, there was an awful lot in those drawers in the patent office. <laughs> um, I don't know of any obvious connection between the work on Brownian motion and the work on special relativity. The, I think they were just two separate projects. The work on general relativity grew out of his work on special relativity. I can't think of any obvious connection between the work on Brownian motion and general relativity. There might be a connection, but it's not. But if there is, uh, it's not clear to me. So I think that um, yeah, he just had a lot of I ideas, and, and, and in that particular year, he had he had um, several different projects going on at the same time. Yes. On the issue, uh, you mentioned the issue by product of uh, uh, atom decay, right? Yes. From the sun. I'm sorry? From atoms from the sun. We get the, ambi the ambient uh, uh, radiation by the decay of the atoms of the sun, right? Um, but it comes from actually not decay, but fusion of oh, atoms fusion, in the yeah. sun. So hi hydrogen atoms yeah. smashing together to form helium. The question is uh, the Earth keeping the, uh, its heat uh, high in the core is a uh, decay of uh, uh, Earth's. That um, yeah, that actually part of the Earth's heat deep, deep, deep down is from radioactive decay in the Earth's core. You're absolutely aware right of that. And actually, that was a real mystery. I don't know if you know the story. That was a real mystery in the 19th century because um, what was happening in the 19th century is the geologists like um, Lyell were looking at geological processes that seemed to have, been, have taken an awful long time to happen. The, lay, you know, the depositing of sediment on, on, on the ocean floor to form rocks and stuff like that. And the geologists came to the conclusion that the Earth was very, very old. And that was a, you know, that set the stage for um, Darwin to come along with his theory of evolution because evolution by natural selection takes a lot of time. So Darwin, by the time he was on the, the, the Beagle on, on that seminal voyage, you know, um, he, he had been reading Lyell's Principle of Geology, and I think he, like, he got the, the, the um, third edition, a uh, third volume of it shipped to him in some South, Africa, South American port or something like that. <laughs> and then you know, Darwin in 1859 publishes The Origin of Species, gets a lot of people upset, People, especially people who didn't like the idea that we were um, uh, uh, that, that we weren't special creations of God, and um, one physicist, um, William Thompson Lord Kelvin, he did a calculation of the of how old the Earth would have to be, on the assumption that it was it started out just this much molten blob of rock and it was just cooling. Um, and he got an estimate, I think, of, I don't remember the numbers, but a lot younger than anyone thought. And um, that was disturbing to some evolutionists. Um, um, one person, um, um, Thomas Henry Huxley, known as Darwin's Bulldog, gave a lecture to the British Academies of Science and says, you know what? If that's a calculation, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> um, uh, um, the, you know, we, we know from geology that, that, that uh, um, the Earth is, fair, is, is older than that. And besides, if we want an estimate of how long evolution, it takes for evolution to happen, well, it happens in the time, it happens in the time that it happens. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. And, what uh, and you know Huxley was right about uh, that th th that um, a calculation is only good as good as the assumptions that go into it, and 
what Kelvin was assuming was the Earth gets started out hot and has been cooling and they had no internal source of heat. And that's and, and that's where that, 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 and, that and, and that's where the cal calculation went awry. So yeah, that's a very important point. Yes. Uh, is that to stellar fusion? Yeah. I've never been able to find out what it is that's getting annihilated. You, you get a, a hydrogen atom and a hydrogen atom, they clang together, and okay, now you got a helium right. atom. What got annihilated? Where, where, where's all this conversion into energy coming from? Where's the loss of matter occurring? Yeah, okay, that's, that's really great. I'm, I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned that. Because, yeah, people um, you know, think, okay, what's happening is energy is getting you know, converted to matter and stuff like that. Is that um, once you get, to, the thing is, once you get a, 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 a hydrogen atom to, to, to um, yeah, uh, um, actually, a helium nucleus is it, it, it's, it's two protons and two, and two neutrons. Slam those, you know, slam those together to, to overcome their repulsion, and then the strong nuclear force kicks in, and, and they're attracted to each other, and um, the actual the that's a lower energy state than when they're separate. Um, so they give off energy to 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 form to, to form that state, right? So um, yeah, so there's this. Um, there's what is called this curve of binding energy, is that as you, you start with light nuclei, they actually it's energetically favorable for them to form heavily nu nu nuclei. They'll, they'll actually give off energy when, when they form up to a, to a certain point. I think it's iron is, 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 is the point at which it actually, you, you, you actually um, have to put more energy in to, to, uh, to um, so you uh, have to put more energy in to um, make them combine. So elements lighter than, I, uh, th th than, than iron, smash them together, you get energy out. Uh, my, uh, 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 um, um, atoms heavier than, ir uh, 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 than iron, you have to put energy in to get them to combine and you get energy out when they, when they split. <coughs> so the, the reason that you get an awful lot of energy out when you split um, uranium atoms, or uranium nuclei is they're way onto the heavy end of the, uh, the, the scale. I have a question about that. Yeah. You're saying that it all happens he from helium atoms coming together to make helium gas? Oh, no, hi hydrogen, at hi hydrogen atoms um, coming together to form, he hydrogen nuclei and, and neutrons coming together to form helium. Yeah. Okay, well, okay, that's a separate thing altogether, but how does the system, or this is a dumb question, how does the system get its, the fuel source uh, back, which is the hydrogen, right? No, 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 yeah. How does it get the hydrogen gas back once it's made the lower energy? Uh, it doesn't. The sun oh, is running out of dies, the right? sun or it's running out of fuel, it's burning out. So if so but if <laughs> I think we only hydrogen then it would burn out, right? In theory. What's that? It's fuel is hydrogen atoms. So if we gave it hydrogen, wouldn't that <laughs> make it? No, I'm serious. That's true. If 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 there was a source of hydrogen going into the sun, it wouldn't necessarily burn out. Okay, well, but um, yeah, but as it is, yeah, every star is burning out. I think we only have a few trillion years left of sunlight left. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I, say that again. Photons travel through space, correct? That's true. So if we're looking at the sun, it's like eight light minutes away or whatever. That's right. Yeah. So if we're looking at stars, for instance, that are like four hundred to a thousand light years away. Yeah. Those photons travel through space for that long to reach our like retina and our eye, right? That's right. Yep. How do they receive so much energy to continue to travel through space for so long? For so us? why don't they get tired? And like we're now, right? Yeah. No, no, no gas stops along the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, here's the thing: is that unlike you and me, um, light just keeps going till something stops them. You know, they, they don't need anything to keep them going. They're, they're just going to keep going until they hit something that, 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 that stops them. So 
they don't need to stop and get uh, a, you know, a coffee and a muffin and keep them going or anything like that. So a lot of infinite energy. Um, no, because they're not losing energy. As long as they're just traveling through empty space, they don't need energy to keep them going. They're not losing energy. They're not expending energy. So that's the difference between them and you and me. Well, okay, the difference is they're going through empty space. So I need energy to keep going if I'm walking here across the room because if I, you know, if I if stop pushing myself, you know, friction would um, stop me. But if I were out in space and um, I were to, you know, jump up and there was nothing but empty space there and there's and, and there no gravitation, I would keep going. I wouldn't need a coffee and a, muff, coffee and a muffin to keep going. I wouldn't be losing any energy. energy. Right. So your car needs energy because it's always having to co uh, overcome. Yeah, your car has to be expending energy to keep going because it always has to over overcome the friction of the road. Um, and um, what happens with the light is it just keeps going. It's not losing energy until it hits something. It's just the speed that it's going. It, it, you think that it would require some sort of a increment of energy to keep going at such high speed, right? Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the thing. You only need to, it just, it, it, you're only losing energy to keep going if you've got something to push against. Like yeah. There's no resistance in space. Yeah, right, exactly. And, and also, the oh, well, quick, <coughs> quick thing about that, sorry, sorry, because then I'll forget. Uh, um, do wa waves require, uh, is there a dissipation of energy with a wave? Because I know a particle, in theory, if, it, if there's nothing acting against it, like you're saying, it will keep going. Is that true for a wave, too? So we're talking about w waves of light? Well, because well, isn't the whole damn thing like the waves and particle crap? Yeah. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so let, yeah, let's, I, I don't want to get into the wave particle thing. That would be another lecture. Um, but, but supposing yeah, that. Yeah, right. Uh, sa same principle. Water waves, air waves require I input of energy to keep going because they have to pu push against friction. You get in a vacuum. Well, there's no water waves in it or light waves. But it is, air suppose waves. there is a wave in a vacuum. Yeah, light wave in a vacuum doesn't need a, a input of energy. Okay, okay. Just so this gentleman is impatient. Yeah. Well, Isaac Newton. Formulate yes. three laws of motion. Right. One of them applies right. based on what has been said here to photons in a sense. That an object or a mass right. will continue in a state of uniform right. uniform non-motion or motion unless acted upon by a some energy or an impressed force, yeah. That's right, yeah. That's I think it was Isaac Newton that defined that, and I think yeah. it's applicable to movement of photons through you are the you are absolutely you are absolutely right and in fact I had Newton's first law in the back of my mind a moment ago when I said when, when that was a pick meant to, that's actually meant to be a paraphrase when I said um, 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 you don't have you, you don't have to lose energy to keep going unless you've got something to push against so that's yeah that's that that's Newton yep now the other thing I want to talk about is, is the fusion reaction that takes place constantly in the sun. Yeah. For eons. Yep. And for eons to, you know, for many, many more right. yep. millions, billions of years. Right. <clears throat> Humankind physicists have been trying to uh, set up controlled fusion reactions as a unlimited right. source of energy for right. we earthlings. Yes. But we haven't been able to do that. Right. My, my question is, how can the sun, how can the fusion of the sun be sustained over such a long period of time? Why, does that, why does that not be a chain reaction which happens instantly like in the hydrogen bomb? Mm -hmm. Why doesn't the sun just simply explode in a fast chain reaction uh, using up all of its material? I don't yeah. understand okay. how that can be so sustained. Okay, here's, here's the best way to think of it. The sun is one huge hydrogen bomb that just keeps going. And the difference between the sun and a fusion reactor that people are trying to make in the lab is you don't want to have a hydrogen bomb that big in your lab. <laughs> so yeah, so, 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 so basically, um, yeah, the... the, the um, think of it like fuel capacity. 
Yeah, so yeah. So that, the, the, the sun is one huge hydrogen bomb that is just so big that the reaction keeps going and going and going. It would be, okay, you know, when, when you drop a, 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 a fusion bomb on a um, on B Bikini Atoll, yeah, it just totally vaporizes it. But yeah, but you could do the same thing to Bikini Atoll by putting it that close to the sun. Like if you, you know, um, and so um, basically, if the problem with um, fusion is controlled fusion. We can make fusion reactions, bombs, but those aren't very useful for heating your homes or something like that because it's, you can't really control, can, can control it. So what people are trying to do is make a reaction that keeps going but can be contained in a, you know, in, in a re reasonable space. And that's, the, that's what's the hard thing. And my attitude is, well, why go to all that effort when we've got this really great fusion reactor that's beaming energy at us all the time. But yeah, so the, prob the problem is controlled fusion in the, in the, in the lab. Big, and, oh, and the reason it doesn't um, blow, blow up is um, there's just so much mass there that the, the, the gravity keeps it from going, for, um, uh, um, keep, 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 keeps it from exploding. But as you know, stars sometimes do blow up. Under certain conditions, you will get a supernova explo explosion. So. Um, yeah, so this, um, what's, what's keeping the sun going, it's got a lot of fuel, it can keep going. It's this very hot, violent reaction, and, and the, the, the sun is basically a balance between the forces trying to push it, push it apart and the gravity pulling it in. Yes? I, I, I suggest what's happening in the sun is a lot of, these countless uh, atoms right. are ricocheting off each other in, in almost an infinite number of times, but it's only those that hit exactly dead on, with enough, perhaps with two more behind them, shoving them together. Yeah. Those are the ones that engage in the fusion. You're right. The rest of them just ricochet, 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 yeah, yeah. because they're not hitting hard enough, they're not hitting right. dead on. Yeah, you're absolutely and, right. And statistical probabilities is that when you get that many atoms, it'll take a long time for them to eventually right. smash together. You're absolutely right, and the only thing that's really keeping it going is that deep inside the sun, you've got an awful lot of pressure, and things are very dense and very hot. Yeah. As the sun, yes. uh, as its light changes, does it, like, say, as the fuel runs low, kind of what you say, yeah. does the properties of like the emission change? I mean, the, um, you know what I'm saying, right? Uh, like, does the um, because the, situ the situation changed the facility itself. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Stars go through a sort of life cycle and they change their properties as, as, yeah. they, as they do. Yes. But it's not, it's over such a large span that the sun won't change properties in our lifetime. Um, that's true. Okay. 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 But it will eventually. Eventually. Will it yes. get, will, does it heat up or slow down? Or what? It doesn't matter. Yeah. I can probably look it up. Yeah. <laughs> okay, this, okay, one last question. We spoke about Brownian motion yes. as being indirect evidence of molecular motion, yes. etc. The surface tension on the surface of a container of water, where you can mm -hmm. float a steel pin on there, right. yeah. is that also evidence of molecular evidence? Of molecular, you know, um, is that evidence of the fact that those molecules are interconnected? thus forming some kind of a web, holding that steel pin in a floating position, whereas in fact, the pin should really sink. I think so, yes. And you were a pin. Yes, I think so. That I, I, another evidence. I, don't I, think, I think you're right. OK, yeah. Great, a good place to end that, I think. Thank you, everyone.